is in the letter to Galatians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 14, in which we hear about Paul writing about law and faith. Paul opens the third chapter here with, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your very eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. The only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Having started with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing. Well then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by doing the works of the law or by your believing what you have heard? Just as Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Here ends our scripture reading for this morning. May it be a blessing to those who hear it and to those who keep it. Amen. Please join with me in a word of prayer. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable unto you, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I went and got myself a water bottle last week. I was looking for it. It was not up here. I was dry the whole time. Oh, man. <clears throat> That's rough. So last week, I have to admit to you, I had my fir- a first in my preaching life. You may remember or were even here when I called everyone in the sanctuary a hypocrite. For we are all hypocrites who profess Christ as our Lord and Savior, we all teach and we preach to others righteousness. Yet we ourselves fall short time and time again of deserving God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's love. We teach others the rights and the wrongs of this world, yet we find ourselves in the, in the wrong right along with everyone else time and time again. We admonish those who commit sin, and those whom we deem to be sinners, and we do so while we reside in sin of our own. Now, I called you all hypocrites. I called myself a hypocrite last week. But for the first time in my life, I experienced something completely new, because after I was done calling all of you hypocrites, you walked out of the sanctuary and you thanked me. I don't think I've ever been thanked for calling someone a hypocrite before. So thank you for that first. That was amazing. You all surprised me. Now this week I'm going to avoid name calling. And instead I'm going to turn to one of the greatest arguments that Paul ever faced in his career. From the very beginning of his own Christian journey right up until the very end. 
In fact, this argument is one that we continue to face today as many Christians throughout history have battled with the concept of what it means to be a Christian and to have rules and regulations found in Scripture, also known as the law of God, and what it means over and against having faith in God, what Jesus' sacrifice upon the cross and fulfillment of the law means. Now, I broke the third chapter of Galatians down into two parts, and today we'll discuss the first half, or the first part of this sermon mini-series, and conclude with part two next week. And while I will avoid calling you all names this week and next week, it might excite you to know that I will be handing out money during this particular part of the summer series, so you can tell your friends that Pastor Jeremy is now paying his members to come to church. It's a whole new evangelism movement. We're going to give it a shot. But before I write you a check this week, or even next week, I want to remind you of a few historical things. The first is that during the time period in which Paul is writing this letter, there were Jews and there were Gentiles. You will, of course, remember that the Jews were the children of God, who followed the law of God, while Gentiles did not. The Jews were given the law through the desert forefathers, Noah, Abraham, Moses, They were given ten major commandments during their time in Exodus from Egypt with Moses. And in reality, they had hundreds of commands of which they had to follow, over 700. To this day, Judaism is not only a religion practiced every once in a while, it is a way of living. Everything that is done in Jewish culture is done for the purpose of their faith in God the clothes that they wear, the traditions and the high holidays that they honor, the ways in which they honor them, the food that they eat, the Sabbath that they recognize, everything, everything, everything in their day-to-day lives is bent towards the purpose of respecting and honoring the law of God. Now, don't get me wrong. The Jews do not hate Jesus. They are not anti-Jesus. In fact, they think that Jesus is a pretty neat guy. They just don't agree with us on the fact that what he did on the cross was the way and is the way to salvation. And so this, along with many other things, is one of the major ways in which we differ from Judaism. Even back when Paul was writing his letter to the Galatians, they still differed in this one major way. But follow along with me in this. After years of the Gentiles being told that they were not worthy of being recognized within the Jewish community, that they were not worthy of being loved by God, or that they were not even something close to resembling something human within their own nature, even Jesus called a Gentile woman a dog in Scripture. And now, now they're being told by Paul, come on in. Baptismal waters are fine. Now before, if you were a Gentile and you wished to convert, you were more than welcome to do so. But first, if you were a male, you had to cut yourself. You had to renounce your former deity publicly. You had to repent for all of the wrong ways. You had to dress yourself like a Jew. And then you had to stand before a council and be examined into the faith. And if you were found worthy, then you would be accepted. So for years, thousands and thousands of years, the Jews were telling the Gentiles, go cut yourself, dress differently, renounce your deity of choice, live your life completely differently from the way in which you live it right now and you're in. Cut yourself, dress yourself, renounce, live your life, you're in. Cut, dress, renounce, live, you're in. Cut, dress, renounce, live, you're in. Cut, dress, renounce, live, and you're in. Then Paul comes along and he says, guys, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story of a man named Jesus who died for your salvation and then came back and ascended into heaven. When I'm done telling you that story, I'm going to offer to dunk you into a a tub or into a pool of water or into a river And if you believe in the saving power of Jesus, you're in. Story time, resurrection, bath time, believe, you're in. 
Now compare those two. Cut, ow, mm -hmm. dress with a whole new wardrobe, renounce and reject everything you know and everything you think that you know about this world, live, live completely differently from the rest of your family, live completely different from the rest of your ancestors, be examined by a council, and you're in. Versus story time, resurrection, get a little wet, believe. Believe, and you're in. Now, those two don't sound the same, do they? One of those requires minor surgery and a few days of an ice pack, while the other one requires you to get a little damp. Do you see how this could be confusing to these new Gentile converts, these new Gentile believers? Why have things changed? What's different? This is very frustrating to those who went through the process those who were converted into Judaism before Paul came along, now they're being told, well, maybe you didn't have to do all those things. This is a drastic shift in the history of the children of God. And that's what I'm trying to convey to you. This is a huge shift in the history of Christianity. And it is one that to this day is still hotly contested in areas all around the world, even within our own country. And you, when you boil these two ways of conversion down to one thing and you refine them, it comes down to this. Law versus faith. Law versus faith. Do we follow the law of God, and that gets us into the pearly white gates and into God's good graces, or do we simply need faith? Do we believe? And then we're in. This is the challenge that Paul faced in his time and it's the challenge we still face today. Now, to illustrate my point, I will use my favorite example of how faith works in using currency, money. Because when you talk about faith and you talk about law, money is the absolute perfect example. There are a ton of laws that surround money, and in order for money to work, there has to be an inordinate amount of faith. Now, what has always amazed me about money is how it obtains and how it sustains its value. I have here before you an American $1 bill. It is rectangular in shape. It has a former president of the United States on the one side, and do you know what building is on the other? Anyone? What building is on the other side of a $1 bill? What is it? A pyramid. He's absolutely correct. There is no Capitol building, which I saw some of you go, Capitol building? Nope. There is a pyramid on the other side. The word one is written on this side. And then there's the American seal of the, the bald eagle. Now, the pyramid to which he referred is known as, and i got to find it again in my notes here, the Eye of Providence. It is the unfinished pyramid, representing either the eye of God watching over all of us or the ever unfinished nature of our great country. It may also may be, may be a Masonic symbol that leads to a treasure map here in the United States, but you can ask, ask Nicolas Cage about that. He'll be able to help you. They made a movie. It's called National Treasure. Go watch movies. Watch TV. Jeez. But this bill, <laughs> this green piece of paper, according to the government, we are told, is worth one dollar. Now, I believe that in exchange for goods and services, that I can hand possession of this $1 note over to another individual who, as long as they also believe that this is worth $1 and that their goods and services provided are worthy of possession of this green piece of paper, that a transaction can take place between the two of us. In order for this dollar bill to retain its value, it requires two things. It requires government declaration and support, but more importantly, it requires belief by the people. Arguably, this bill only holds its value as long as we believe that it does. 
As soon as the grand populace no longer believes that this holds its value, it becomes a simple green piece of paper with really neat art on it. Now, I have a similar rectangular shaped green piece of paper here in my possession, and this one has the number 50 written on it. I got this from John Motter's pocket. <laughs> like the $1 bill, this also has a former president on one side, and it does have the Capitol building on the other. Today, there are many other things that add, are added on to the $50 bill that in comparison to the $1 bill prevents it from replication. There's a watermark on here. There's a magnetic strip. There's fancy ink and so on. But this bill, in comparison to this bill, this one is worth 50 times more than this one. Why? Because we believe it does. Without belief, these two pieces of identical paper are completely worthless. They require belief in order to represent what we and the United States government say it represents. Now, there are also a lot of laws surrounding these two bills. One I've already mentioned to you. By federal law, no one may reprint these notes except for the United States Mint. Also, as long as it is understood that these pieces of paper are in my possession, no one no one in this room may legally obtain these notes from me without a mutually agreed upon exchange of goods and services. Should they be acquired by any other means, that's illegal theft by the law. Unless, of course, you're the U.S. government, then that's called taxes, but I don't have time to go into that. So, money requires belief, and possession of that money requires the law. Now, so far, I've only discussed the governmental laws about money. But, of course, there are also religious laws, God-given laws, scriptural laws about money, such as interest. According to scripture, charging interest on those who are less well-off and less wealthy is a cursed and unworthy act. Now, if someone could tell Visa that, that'd be great. But Exodus... Chapter 22, verse 25, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. You shall not exact interest from them. That is the law of God. So when you lend your friend $5, you don't ask for six back, you ask for five back. Or better yet, you forgive the debt altogether and you don't worry about the $5. Now, of course, that's easy to do when it's five of these ones, but perhaps it's a little harder when it's five of these fifties. But then there's another of God's laws surrounding money. That is of tithing. Returning or blessing 10% of what God has given to you as a holy offering to God. Something that we practice here in church every week through our offerings and through our gatherings of gifts. For Jews, this law is absolute. Everything required a tenth to be blessed and to be given to God. In our offerings today, we have faith that every member of our church will do their best in achieving 10% tithe in support of the ministry of our congregation, both domestically and abroad, through monetary means and through the dedication of our time and of our talents. But today, of course, we're talking about the monetary and so we have even more faith surrounding our money. Faith that it will be given. Faith that it will be shared. Faith that this money makes its way into our offering plate and that it will be used according to our bylaws. And if you write something particular on your envelope, that CANDA will get it to the specific place that you desire. You see, money has a lot to do with the law and with faith. It requires both of those things in order for it to function. And so I believe it is the perfect example for us Christians who struggle with following the law of God, but also relying on our faith in God. Paul would say that it is faith alone that saves us. And to that point, I find that I must agree with him. Faith in Jesus Christ and the saving power of his sacrifice upon the cross is indeed crucial for us. But we must also strive to do our best to adhere to 
some guidelines on how best to live our lives in this world. So this Sunday, I'm going to place this $1 bill and I'm going to place this $50 bill into our offering plate. This bill has never seen an offering plate. This one probably has many times. I'm not going to mark where it's going to go. I'm going to have faith that the leadership of our church and the leadership of this community will decide how best to use it. And I will do so according to God's law. That law being that I return a portion of what I have received in an effort to achieve God's will here on earth. In return for my offering, I expect nothing from God. I do not expect interest. I do not anticipate nor expect riches. I do not expect that God will save me from this act or through this act. I simply give in celebration for all of the things that God has blessed me with. This congregation and this church family chief amongst them. And I would hope, I would hope and I would have faith that this Sunday and every Sunday that you would do the same. For neither God's law nor my faith tell me that God will love me more because of what I have given, but that God is pleased simply in my effort of giving. And so to this end, I thank God for the opportunity to have faith in God, but also to follow God's law. That God's law will help me and guide me. And that no matter what I do, God will always, always, always love me. Thanks be to God. Amen.